Nineveh, from its very inception, Nineveh was established as an expression of rebellion against God, and its foundation was laid in opposition to the commandments of God. We learn from Genesis, the 10th chapter, that Nimrod, after building the cities of Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Calne in the land of Shinar, went into Assyria and built Nineveh. Nimrod, of course, was a mighty hunter before the Lord, and he followed in the footsteps of the mighty men who lived before the flood, that's in Genesis, the 6th chapter, and whose every thought and intention was only evil continually. This is made evident by the stated purpose of those who desired to build the city along with Nimrod, the Tower of Babel. They said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. You find that in Genesis 11th chapter. Now, no, that wasn't the first Illuminati. According to Hendrik Van Cleve, the very purpose of the city and its tower was the exaltation of man, a very prideful and arrogant act, which not only dishonored the name of the Lord, but sought to supplant his rule and authority by disobeying his commission to be fruitful, multiply, and fulfill, or excuse me, fill the earth. Now, those who proposed the building of Babel were led forward in their rebellion by Nimrod, for Babel was the beginning of his kingdom. Now, the audacity of Nimrod is demonstrated in his mightiness. Not only did he have wicked thoughts and intentions of heart, but he flaunted his apostasy in the face of God. He built city after city in opposition to the command of God, and yet, after he had built four cities, he could not rest until he had traveled to Assyria and continued his humanistic campaign by building Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ur, Kala, and Rezin. Babel was the forerunner of Nineveh. And it was Babel's vision of exalting man and its purpose of supplanting the rule of God that were uh, summarily adopted by Nineveh. Hence, we find that from its very foundation, Nineveh was established for the purpose of drawing people away from the knowledge and worship of the one true God, Jehovah. It was established with the intention of preventing obedience to God and insisting on the idea that man's unity secures prosperity. Its cornerstone was laid on the doctrine of humanism, the deification of man. The self-asserted and pompous attempt of any civil government to supplant the rule of God by establishing a social order that is in rebellion to God's revealed will is regarded as folly in the eyes of the Lord. The book of Nahum clearly sets forth the rebellion of Nineveh as a city that has positioned herself against the Lord as his enemy and his adversary. Nineveh was a city that plotted evil against the Lord and practiced unceasing evil. Now, the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, whose capital was Nineveh, sent his messenger to Hezekiah, king of Judah, to mock the living God and boast of his defiance against the Lord. Okay? Now, as a testimony to her own strength, Nineveh exalted herself 
and uttered a declaration of her own divinity. She declared, and you'll find this in Zephaniah 2.15, I am, and there is no one else. Man, this self-assertion of divinity laid the foundation for building a social order that was at war with the law of God. It established a rule of ethics that was built on man's reason, void of biblical revelation, and thereby setting the basis for justifying all kinds of evil, drunkenness, idolatry, cursing, murder, lying, theft, prostitution, and the apathetic indifferences among rulers. Now, because of Nineveh's, uh, excuse me, Nineveh's unceasing evil, the Lord declares numerous times that he's against Nineveh and that she is an enemy and an adversary. The culmination of God's disgust with Nineveh is found in the great woe that describes her as the bloody city. That's in Nahum, third chapter, first verse. This description is absolutely fitting because of the horrific murders that took place during her prominence. The first reference of these murders are those performed by the worshipers of one of their idol gods who sacrifice uh, their children in and out of fire as a devotion to this false god. Okay. Now, the king's devotion to this false god is demonstrated by his son bearing this god's very name. You'll find that in the book of 2 Kings, the 19th chapter, 37th verse, and Isaiah 37, 38. The second act of murder that was perpetrated in Nineveh is horrific, disgusting, and unimaginable act of King Adremelech. They struck down their own father. That was Adremelech and uh, Sherezer, his sons. Uh, and it, that, that was horrific. You'll find that in 2 Kings 19 chapter and also Isaiah the 37th chapter. Hence, the depiction of Nineveh as the bloody city is most fitting. And the graphic picture described by Nahum of a city of dead bodies without end that causes the attacking horses to stumble is horrifyingly accurate. It's horrific. Can you imagine? So many dishes, so many dead people, dead bodies just laying all over the place that even an army attacking them, the horses can't can't keep from stumbling over the dead bodies. Nineveh is the city where fathers kill their sons and sons kill their fathers. There is a second aspect to the woe that is pronounced upon Nineveh, and that is in relation to her whoring and prostitution. Nineveh was a city of sexual fornication, and let's just say all sorts of sexual, gay, lesbian, uh, homosexual, transgender, transsexual, transvestite, whatever. It's the, it was a city that was full of sexual deviances and variations. And thus, it was a city that was at war with God's fundamental institution, the family. The family unit, according to the decree of God, is composed of a husband and wife, male and female, who raise up a godly seed and advance the kingdom of God over all the earth. You'll find that in Genesis, the second chapter, verse 26 to 28. Now, this family unit is a picture of Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. And you'll find that in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, the 32nd verse. Because Nineveh took what God calls wickedness and turned it into something 
graceful, and charming, God made Nineveh a spectacle that all who will look upon will shrink away from. As a result of these atrocities that Nineveh perpetrated against the Lord, she was made a desolation and laid waste like a desert. Yet, Nineveh was not destroyed by God's wrath without being shown mercy. God summoned the prophet Jonah, Jonah, who's Jonah, to call out against that great city because of their evil that had come up before him. This call was a decree of judgment that would come upon that city for great evil within 40 days. And that message alerted the people of Nineveh to the punishment and consequences of their sins. The people of Nineveh humbled themselves before the Lord by fasting and putting on sackcloth. Likewise, upon hearing the judgment of the Lord, the king of Nineveh made it a decree, removed himself from his throne, humbled himself by replacing his vesture of authority with sackcloth and ashes and placing himself in submission to God. Now, you, as, as crazy as it sounds, a place with so much going on, I mean, you would think that these people had no knowledge of God, but they did, just like today. You know God, but you have turned yourself and your attention to that which glitters. The history of Nineveh ought to be a sobering realization for many generations. Nineveh was founded and established in rebellion to the Lord, yet God was merciful and relented from destroying her when the people repented and turned from their evil ways. Now, Nineveh was built and established by Nimrod very wicked man. And he himself established the atmosphere, the social climate, the behaviors, however sinful they were, however wicked they were. Now, after he was killed, Sennacherib became king. We call it Assyria. Uh, at that time, it was the kingdom of Shinar. And you asked, what was the wickedness of Nineveh as a flourishing capital of the Assyrian Empire? The actual behaviors, wickedness that colonized the atmosphere of Nineveh, which was the major city in the kingdom of Shinar, included, but are not limited to, constructing and placement and the worship of idols, which were made of wood and various other precious metals, human sacrifice, and not to mention the incest, uh, we call it self-breeding today, or what is it, in-house breeding or whatever you call it. Uh, Nimrod did that with his mom, and they, they had a son. Uh, but Nimrod promoted that. Uh, in promotion or exaltation of the power of humanism over that of God Jehovah, whom he himself once worshipped. Now that practice is yet conducted in many places in the world. Let's talk about Jonah, one of the minor prophets. In other words, he wasn't around very long or involved in ministry with the um, people of God, Israel. He didn't have very much to do with them. Maybe he was just a convert or a parishioner. Uh, who knows? Because there's very, very little known of him in the Christian world. However, here's a a curveball for you. 
the Muslims respect Jonah. Now, here's a name that you don't hear. His name is not pronounced Jonah. It's pronounced Eunice. That is Y-U-N-U-S. Eunice. But we say Jonah. Okay. Now let's 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 just let's go into something here and uh because some people say, hey, you know, Jonah was really a man of the Islam faith uh, that respected God, you know, uh, and, you know, he may have been a convert to Judaism, um, but since this was during a time when Israel had been split all up and there was a whole bunch of crap going on all over the place and, and you know, it was God who gave Jonah the message of Eunice the message, to go to this major city. Now, I want to talk to you about something that happened at the end of July in 2014. And that is, uh, in accordance with the Associated Press, that members of the Islamic State of Iraq and uh, al-Sham, which is ISIS, the ruthless militant group currently marauding through Iraq, reportedly blew up the tomb of the prophet Yunus. The burial site of Yunus, commonly known to many Christians as the biblical figure Jonah, was located in the modern-day city of Mosul, which is, or which once was the biblical city of Nineveh. Okay, let me say that again. The modern-day city of Mosul was once the biblical city of Nineveh and was seen by many archaeologists and religious scholars as an ancient and precious religious artifact. It would be easy to cast this latest act of cultural violence as another example of ISIS attacking Christians, a group that has no doubt endured harsh and at times horrific treatment under ISIS rule. But the destruction of Jonah's shrine is actually a bit more complicated than singling out one religious tradition. For starters, the Jonah story isn't exclusive to Christianity. I guess you didn't know that, did you? Jews also revere the prophet, as do Muslims. And for your information, there's an entire book of the Quran aptly titled Jonah, dedicated to the prophet. And the Muslim prophet Muhammad is said to have declared, one should not say that I am better than Jonah. It is for this reason that representatives from multiple religious traditions, not just Christians, lamented the loss of the shrine. Now, Rabbi Benjamin Bleck, uh, a Talmud professor in New York, which co-authored a piece for the Wall Street Journal, uh, declared that desecration of Jonah's final resting place is a blow not only to his memory, but more tragically to his message of universal concern for those of all faiths, the message that still remains the only hope for civilized mankind. Then you have various Muslims, including locals in Mosul, also condemned the destruction Okay. Now, you have a Sunni preacher which lived in Lebanon who is said to be sympathetic to mil uh, mil militants in Iraq. He said, Iraq's committee of Muslim scholars would like to underline the huge loss for the people of Mosul who saw these blessed mosques as landmarks of the city, a part of its culture and history. 
His name was Dari. And he was speaking to the Daily Star. So, if blowing up Jonah's shrine makes pretty much everyone equally angry, why did ISIS do it? The answer lies in ISIS's peculiarly orthodox and destructive theology, which, among other things, abhors all religious shrines because they're seen as a form of idolatry. Get that? Now, this is par for the course of concern among strands of Salafi movements like ISIS. Now, you say, Ooh, what is this Salafi? The Salafi were the ancient Muslims. They were the original Islamic group. And what ISIS wants, or it's what they seek, is a radical return to their understanding of how the earliest Muslims, or Salaf, lived. That's what they seek. That's what they want. And you got all of these other people that are conducting their own theories and warring ideologies to prevent such. There was a guy named Mark Mavzezian, and he pointed out uh, that one should see ISIS's destruction of the tomb of Jonah as an act principally directed at other Muslims, not Christians. Now, that should raise your eyebrow, and that's why some people think that Jonah was a Salaf, an early Muslim. Something that will raise your other eyebrow is when ISIS destroyed the tomb of Jonah, they failed to remove copies of the Quran and other holy books from the building. Now, the locals found these damaged books while walking through the rubble and removed them. That was so offensive okay, to other Muslims that it allegedly sparked what could be the early stages of localized resistance against ISIS within Mosul. A lot of things people don't understand and they don't know. And a lot of preachers and ministers and people who are teachers of the Bible don't study these things to be able to go into them so that the people of God are aware of why we are warring in certain places. Maybe we should be there, maybe we shouldn't. I'm not one to say that. But you can say this. The reasons for religious wars is totally different from that of one person in a government or five people uh, that are in a government saying, hey, we want the oil or we want this or we want that. It's totally different. Religious wars are based on religious ideologies and faith. So, who knows? Certainly, Jonas wasn't a Christian. Was he a Muslim? Was he a Salaf? One of the ancient uh, members of Islam? Who knows? So little is known of this guy that uh, you know he, 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 he might be the connecting point. Him and Nahum might be the missing links that is hidden right in front of our eyes that connects the will of God to the desire and a submission to the will of God, which is summed up in one word, Islam, to the hearts, minds, and desires of people who call themselves Christians but won't submit to the will of God. We say we are not under the law because if we were, Many who were running around marrying three or four times and, you know, call themselves coming out of the closet and everybody's going, oh, we have more respect for him now because we know him or her, whoever it might be, you know, 
doing this and doing that and just doing all kinds of abominable things that are against the law of the laws of Judaism. But we believe that our Savior came out of that. So see, a lot of people are confused. And so they don't teach on it. They don't preach on it. They don't minister on it. They don't they don't hold people accountable. They say, well, you just have to hold yourself accountable. Well, if you're not shown or given the material by which you can adjust your thinking, then your thinking will remain in the congregation of the wicked. It will remain in the community of Nineveh. That's what we're talking about. Let's talk about Jonah some more. Let's put ourselves in Jonah's mindset. Let's imagine. Imagine you get the order that Jonah got. Then, because you're happy, roll you're happy to be a prophet behind into Las Vegas or Atlantic City, all for the purpose of shutting down iniquity, even if it gets you arrested, charged with terroristic threatening, convicted and sentenced to prison. Imagine that. But you proceed unabated to the city hall. You call out the mayor exclaiming, in 40 days God is going to destroy this city unless it repents and turns from its wickedness. Now, you'd suppose immediately everyone, including Christians, would categorize you to be some sort of terrorist, having ties to an anti-American organization such as ISIS, even though you're unarmed. The NSA and all other intelligence agencies would begin a thorough search into your background, your history. And perhaps, as did they with Jonah, discover you to have ties to Salafi, the ancient Muslims. What would you do that was any different from the actions taken by Jonah? to avoid such problematic situation. He decided to take a a trip the opposite direction, get on a ship and go to Tarshish. Yes, they discovered copies of the Quran and other Islamic documents along with the Torah, buried in the grave with Eunice. So it's not an oxymoron for Minister Louis Farrakhan to proclaim himself both Muslim and Jew. Jonah is a respected prophet to those of Islam, an unknown relic to those of Christianity, though the grace of God is revealed to all mankind. That's what we read and that's what we believe. Now, you may have forgotten that Sodom and Gomorrah was also cities that were built and established by Nimrod. And in those places is where Lot went, I should say. That's where he settled at when him and Abraham decided to split because they had issues going on with their servants and all of that kind of thing. He went there. Well, Sodom and Gomorrah, were also cities in the kingdom, in the Shinar kingdom, which was established by Nimrod. So, as we deal with Nineveh, we're talking about everything that was going on when God decided to destroy destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and save Lot. The question is, who was in Nineveh? Nineveh. Who was in Nineveh? Well, I mentioned a couple of USA cities. I mentioned Las Vegas and I mentioned Atlantic City. So let's just take a look. If we were to compare these places as uh, sin cities, let's say that for the record, 
Las Vegas has over 150 Christian churches listed. Let me say that again. Las Vegas, Nevada, has over 150 Christian churches listed, yet it is known as Sin City. Atlantic City, New Jersey, has over 35 Christian churches listed. Atlantic City has over 35 Christian churches listed. Yet it is called Sin City. So, Nineveh, the adult playpen of the Middle East, as does every other sin city of the world, yet had a bunch of folks who believed in God Jehovah, but were embedded within the fabric of its wickedness, just as we are today. Ask yourself another question. Where is Nineveh? Where is Nineveh? Oh, don't tell me, oh, it's over there in the Middle East and it's been covered up and they're trying to dig it up. No, that's not the answer. Nineveh is the social climate of every major and or controlling city in the United States of America. Nineveh is the social climate of every major and or controlling city in the United States of of America. So I asked, why wasn't Jonah arrested, charged with c criminal conspiracy or behavior, and sentenced to prison? Why wasn't he arrested? The answer is, is because the king and the citizens of Nineveh knew God. They knew God. They had backslid yet understood the grace that had again brought the word of the Lord unto them. They understood the call to repentance, that they perhaps might find grace, salvation. Let's take it a little higher, because we're still talking about in Nineveh. Who else is in Nineveh? We have females who allowed themselves to believe that God had sent them their Boaz. Instead, they became the prey of a boa that is a constrictor that has wrapped himself around their life and is squeezing the spirituality from their world. We have men who's allowed themselves to believe that God has sent them their Eve. Instead, they become prey to a Jezebel, one whose eyes are filled with wantonness, whose character is filled with guile and all sorts of evil. She claims is just her being her, and you've got to accept all of her to have any of her. She's one who aims to destroy those men of God which whom, with whom you are in fellowship. We have Christians who've allowed the pride of life and the lust of their flesh to overrule their God-given sense of reason. They've created so much debt they can't afford to participate in church activities, study the scriptures and hold Bible study with the children, minister to the needy, the sick shut in, care for the widows and orphans, care for those in prison, or any other attribute that separates disciples of Christ from the world. In Nineveh, we have couples who have a public image of perfection, but are no longer one. They've determined it is equally beneficial for they both to deceive the public in order to achieve their financial goal in life. Hence, they are adulterous like poisonous snakes. You can't always hear their hiss. In Nineveh, you have those who promote singleness rather than the plan of God for male and female. 
They exalt bad behavior performed by members of the opposite gender as a means to turn the minds of God's people from one another unto those who oppose the sanctification required in holiness and acceptability unto God. They claim men are subordinate to the ideologies of women and should be vetted by other haughty-minded and disrespectful persons. In Nineveh, we also have church leaders who would be a god. This was a small g by subtle display of their controlling spirit. They require your life. Their plans and wants always come before yours. You don't have the right to be blessed beyond their carnality. They control every aspect of your claimed spiritual gift and will silence you when you follow the leading of the Holy Ghost instead of their plan. We have those who think they're worshiping God just because they attend scheduled Sunday church services and donate to the cause. They understand their euphoric reaction to planned emotional triggers, you know, that's singing and music, must be the Holy Spirit that is affecting their mindset at the moment. In Nineveh, we have those who are sick. Yes, they know what the Bible says, but they refuse to call for the elders of the church because modern science has made it possible for them to live with illness while getting paid. So while they appear to be praising God, they're living in apostasy. They have surrendered faith in the power of God to the advancement of modern technology. In Nineveh, we have those who seek to know the bad behaviors of what could be such in others so that they can have dirt with which to control the narrative in any situation where they must win. And in Nineveh, we also have those who have accepted paganism, thinking that if they don't, they won't have religious freedom. They'd be set aside, criticized, orphaned, excommunicated, and are emotionally trodden down, yet they have not the spirit of freedom. Who else is in Nineveh? You and I. But I hear the voice of God in Jeremiah, the third chapter and the 14th verse, turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. So with all due respect, I cannot say that the city of Las Vegas, Nevada, or the ATL, Atlantic City, New Jersey, or the sin cities of the USA, I must say that wickedness doth abound. And God is calling us to repentance, to turn from our wickedness to flee wickedness, to flee sin and return unto him. Take a look at some of the data that is already collected by this country. People who monitor what's going on. You look at the violent cities in the USA and then you look at things like states that have the highest human sex trafficking, sex slavery, adolescent rape. Why was Nineveh selected by Jehovah God for annihilation? Why? You see, a lot of preachers, a lot of teachers of the word won't go into it because here in USA, if you try to go into that, you're going to step on a whole lot of people's toes and some of those people's toes that you step on would have your head. So 
Why was Nineveh selected? See, we can't say that we're limited to Vegas and Atlantic City or New York or California or Los Angeles or Compton or Chicago or we can't we can't limit this to a couple of places and isolate everywhere else as if it's all pristine and it's all Christian and we're the good guys. That's a crock. Nineveh, as referenced in Nahum, the second chapter, Jonah, the third chapter, and the book of Jasher, the ninth chapter, verse 15 through 19, had the highest rate of the following abominable sins against God. It had the highest rate drug sale and abuse, human trafficking, that is, human sex trafficking and pornography, bestiality, homosexuality, rape, incest, violent crime, worship of idols, which is images made of various materials, whether it's wood, cloth, metal, what have you, Worship of human beings, deification. Worship of celestial beings. Worship of the sun. Worship of the moon. Witchcraft and divination. Time would run out if we went into every aspect. But just to give you a little more insight into the fact that that we are living in a wicked society that needs to return unto the Lord. We need to repent and return unto the Lord. Greater than 50% of the states in the United States of America have documented incest. Incest, yes, that is inbreeding. Take a look. You'll see for yourself. 